I'm Steve Ryder, producer of the Breakpoint Podcast. How do we reintegrate our faith and our daily work? Or to put it another way, how do we announce and live out the kingdom of God through our day-to-day job or profession? Today on the Breakpoint Podcast, we present a Colson Fellows webinar with Dr. Amy Sherman, director of the Center on Faith and Communities at the Sagamore Institute. Her topic, vocational stewardship. Before I get to Dr. Sherman, I want to let you know that we're now accepting applications for the Colson Fellows at colsonfellows.org. This program prepares Christians in all walks of life to become leaders in their spheres of influence. During their 10 months of intensive worldview training, Colson Fellows attend webinars with Christian leaders like the one you're about to hear with Dr. Amy Sherman. They attend residencies, read classic books on Christian worldview, and prepare a concrete plan for ministry. Again, apply at colsonfellows.org. Now, here's our Colson Fellows webinar with Dr. Amy Sherman, hosted by Colson Fellows National Director, Bill Brown. Okay, well, Dr. Amy Sherman. Um, Amy is a senior fellow at Sagamore Institute for Policy Research, where she directs the Center on Faith in communities. Back in 2012, Christianity Today named her as one of the 50 most influential evangelical women in America. Uh, She's the author of six books, over 80 articles, and all kinds of publications include some of my favorites, First Things, uh, Policy Review, uh, Public Interest, Christian Century, Christianity Today, Books and Culture, and so on. She works closely with an organization called Made to Flourish, which is a pastor's network for the common good, it focuses on issues of faith and work. Now, the book that you read, Kingdom Calling, Vocational Stewardship for the Common Good, was awarded Book of the Year in the Christian Living category by Christianity Today. Uh, you can see her articles regularly on the MTF, Made to Flourish website. I go there. It's just really, really good. And at the Green Room, a blog sponsored by the Theology of Work Project. She's the founder and former executive director of a Charlottesville Abundant Life Ministries, an urban ministry in Charlottesville where she lives. She served for several years as a volunteer senior fellow with the International Justice Mission, one of our favorite organizations at the Colson Fellows. She's a longtime member of Trinity Presbyterian Church. Uh, she earned her BA in political science at Messiah College, a really, really good school, and her MA and PhD in international economic development from the University of Virginia. So, Amy, we are blessed to have you with us tonight. Thanks for taking time. Well, I'm delighted to be with you. Thank you. We just love your book and your writings and so on, and I was really grateful that everybody was able to dive into you and what you'd written in your Kingdom Calling. And for many people who read that book, they realize this is just sticking your toe in the water. This is the beginning of what is really a lifelong a worldview perspective of what God is doing. Uh, can I just ask in general how you got involved in thinking this way and then focusing your ministry in this area? Sure. My path towards it was a little bit uh, different. A, a lot of folks that write about faith and work um, come from uh, the business world or they've been in the world of marketplace ministry. Mm-hmm. And that's not actually my background. My background is in Christian community development. And I think what I realized over the years uh, was that since I'm very, very passionate about seeing our communities transformed and seeing the kingdom of God really expressed in visible ways in our communities, what I realized was that in order for that to happen, we really need individual Christians to have a very robust sense of how to advance the kingdom of God through their daily work. If we're looking to them to sort of just dive into volunteer work and um, kind of work on the edges of the time that they have available in various social justice kinds of uh, programs, we're not going to really see really robust community transformation. Mm. What really needs Mm -hmm. to happen is for people to work for that through what they spend most of their time doing, which uh, at least their waking hours, which is their work. And so I came to the Faith and Work conversation sort of by way of the Christian Community Development Conversation, which is a little bit of a different pathway. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's fascinating. Uh, people who read your book, a lot of them will tell me, I said, what did you like about it? And they, many of them will say, well, she had me at Proverbs 11.10. 
<laughs> and uh, which I, you probably should hear that, but I think that's cool because I was the same way. We want to talk a little bit about how Proverbs eleven ten, you know, which you, is in the preface of your book, is a foundation. We'll talk about that just a little bit. Well, it was really a sermon by Tim Keller that I listened to many years ago that mm -hmm. drew my attention to that verse, and you know, to understand the whole vision of rejoicing your city would obviously speak to someone like myself whose life is devoted towards ministry among the poor and the desire to see our communities and our cities uh, truly rejoice. And so Keller's vision of Proverbs 11.10, when the righteous prosper, the city rejoices, his, his vision that, that we, the people of God, um, are the righteous and we are the prospering, uh, so many of us have so much more opportunity, so much more privilege, so much more training and education than so many people around the world. His vision to sort of call out the church to say, we need to steward that prosperity very diligently and even sacrificially in order to take all the blessing that we have received from God and then become a blessing to others, to pour out all that we have been given, um, the power, the wealth, the privilege, the knowledge, the networks, the opportunities, the skills, everything that we've been given, all these assets, that that verse is calling us to pour those things out very generously um, in such a way that others in our communities will benefit very deeply and our cities will become joyful <laughs> because justice mm -hmm. will roll down and beauty will be advanced and hope will be advanced and community will flourish. Um, all of that just simply captured my imagination in a very profound way and I found myself thinking why haven't I heard that message before why isn't the church talking more about how we can be stewarding um, all that we have been given and particularly how we can be stewarding the vocational power that we've been given so that his uh, laying out of that that picture in that verse definitely was the motivation behind writing the book Mm. Well, that, that's beautiful. Uh, uh, interesting story. I was interviewed by New York Times a couple of days ago, and this on some political things. Why, why me? I don't know, but I've done these <laughs> things before. And they, she, she asked me about Donald Trump's uh, tax returns and so on, and what I thought about it. I said, you know, I'd really be interested to see how much he actually gives to charity, because I think that's important. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, she said, well, why would that be important? And I, so I told her, you know, as Christians, you know, my wife and I, we like to give away as much as we can because we are so blessed. We feel that's what we should be doing. It's, uh, and so on. And I explained all of that. And there was just dead silence on the end of the phone. Like, this is the first wow. time she ever, ever heard that. I think considered wow. it to be wow. important at all, you know. So anyway, wow. well, let me ask you this question. Um, why don't you hear the message that you just talked about somewhere else other than Tim Keller's church? I mean, I've never heard a sermon on faith and works integration or, I mean, it just it doesn't happen. Why do you think that's true? I'm glad that I think it's slowly beginning to change, but we still have the majority of our, our churches that really aren't focused on this very much. And I think there's a few reasons for that. Um, probably the most dominant one is a kind of lingering sacred secular divide that continues to plague the Christian community whereby we, you know, somehow in a very platonic kind of uh, sense, a very Greek, not very Hebrew sense, we've thought that what's really important is sort of spiritual stuff, and the work that really matters is what the pastor does and the missionary does, and then there's a few marketplace people like, you know, doctors and nurses and social workers, and they kind of do important stuff, but everybody else just sort of is making a living and working for the quote-unquote secular society. Mm -hmm. And, um, of course, that's a very mistaken understanding, I think, but it does really pervade. And the tragic thing is that even when a lot of congregational leaders will say, oh, I don't believe in the sacred secular divide, I believe that, you know, all of the earth is the Lord's, I believe that Jesus Christ is on a mission to renew all things, I believe that uh, the person out in the business world and the, the person who's a journalist, you know, the work that they're doing is every bit as important. Even if they say that they believe that, so often the practices and the language in our church um, don't line up with that, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we'll mm -hmm. have people will say things like, oh, did you hear about Jim? He left his, left his job in the law firm to go into the ministry and work for young ones. 
you know, mm-hmm. as though all those years working in the law firm was a ministry. I think that's the biggest one is that sacred secular divide. A second one that I talk in the, in the book about is um, what I call a truncated gospel. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, an understanding of the Christian faith that sort of starts with Genesis 3 with the fall and our sin and ends at Revelation 20 uh, with the great mm-hmm. white throne judgment instead of a Christian understanding of the gospel that obviously includes that critical message of sin and redemption, but that also embeds that in the broader biblical narrative, which begins not at Genesis 3, but at Genesis 1 with creation, Mm -hmm. and ends not at Revelation 20, but at Revelation 22 with the new creation. Um, Mm -hmm. And so when we have our, sort of what Andy Crouch calls the bookends of our understanding of the gospel in the wrong places, then we're sort of saying, well, the only thing that really matters is that people are sinners and they need to get saved. And then in the end, that, you know, the big thing is judgment, as opposed to saying, well, yeah, obviously that's critical, that's at the heart of the gospel, but the truest thing about us is that we're made in the image of God and that we were given a mandate to, to join God in a loving relationship with Him and to do His work in the world and then to follow Him as renewed people, paid for by Christ and his atonement and joining him in his, you know, mission to bring about the renewal of all things until the new creation comes in Christ at his return. So if we only think that sort of, you know, the only thing that lasts are the souls of men and the word of God, which somebody famous said, but it's not really true, (laughs) because more than the souls of men remain, right? Um, Our bodies remain and culture remains and So when our gospel is too small, um, you know, we're so focused on evangelism um, that we forget about the cultural mandate and we forget about cultural flourishing and we forget about a lot of, you know, other very, very important things. And then I'd say the other thing, uh, Bill, is that from a very practical perspective, I think, frankly, sometimes pastors are just intimidated by marketplace people. And they just, you know, it's not a world that they know. And so they don't have a whole lot to say about what kind of goes on outside the four walls of the church because it's not their world. And so they don't talk a whole lot about integrating faith with daily work outside the walls of the church because it's just that's a foreign arena for them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's excellent. In fact, I think it was Andy who said that the scriptures or God's revelation does not begin with God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, but in the beginning God created and and so on. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a yeah. very bold story that includes everything. And I, you know, we can't separate evangelism from the restoration and flourishing that's intended because I think it's right. all one. It all comes together. That's right. And, uh, that's right. So in the book, you argue that faith and work integration, it's more than just you need to be an honest person. You need to have a good character in what you do. You even talk about it getting down into the kind of work that the person does, how they do their work. Will you talk about that just a little bit? Yeah, sure. I think that marketplace ministries in general have done a very good job at helping Christians to navigate sort of the world of work in terms of um, navigating the ethical challenges that people face and in terms of encouraging people to practice those spiritual formation disciplines that will help them to grow in Christ-like character, which is really a crucial part of integrating our faith and our work. Uh, I mean, our Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. faith and work integration ought to very much be about seeing your work as worship and seeking to bear the image of Christ and the character of Christ in and through that work. But it is more than just the character because the work itself really matters. And it matters because God created it. Um, God created the field of law and the field of engineering and the field of architecture. And he created the arts and culture and he created the sciences. And these fields of work are very important and they matter to God and they have, I think, basic creational purposes. You know, we are set into a created order with the mandate to bring about the development of the whole earth and the development of civilization and culture. And we're to do that in ways that apply God's beauty and his justice and his love and his light in all those different fields. And when we recognize that in the fall, uh, what was lost was not only our personal sort of individual relationship with God, 
which of course was lost, and we went from spiritual intimacy to spiritual alienation. And mm-hmm. that was absolutely tragic. And praise God that Jesus has come and made a way for us to return. But that was not the only thing that was lost in the fall because we lost everything. It was a cosmic fall. And the very institutions of culture and all the various fields of work also became fallen. And so now we do our work in these fields of engineering and education and politics and business and finance. We do those things uh, in the midst of a context in which those fields were meant for certain kinds of creational purposes by God. Um, Mm -hmm. Now they have become tainted by the corruption of the fall. And now we as believers are salt and light working in those fields, seeking to, you know, sort of cooperate with King Jesus as he works for the restoration and the renewal of things in those sectors to be the way that they ought to be. And so becoming the kind of engineer who not only is honest and puts in the honest bid for a job and doing that, but to be the kind of engineer that is thinking about people's safety and thinking about how do I design and engineer things in ways that are, you know, really good for human flourishing and and how do I design and engineer things and build things in a way that promotes harmony between human beings and and the created order as opposed to in ways that sort of harm the harm the environment of the creation. Uh, so the work itself really matters and not just the way that we do the work. Mm-hmm. That's great because it makes people stop and think, uh, using your example as an engineer, how is a Christian who is an engineer different from a, a non-Christian who's an engineer in what we do and, and the kinds of things that we think and the kinds of ways that we extrapolate from our work to the world around us and, and so on. And I think that's important. And some part of your book is uh, vocational stewardship for the common good. And uh, you define, here's a quote, you define vocational stewardship, which I really like that, that phrase, by the way, the intentional and strategic deployment of all the dimensions of our vocational power to advance foretastes of the kingdom of God. That's such a great, great description. Give us some great examples of marketplace professionals that really put this into practice. Well, by those foretastes of the kingdom, I'm referring to what I would call the, the marks of the consummated kingdom. So as we mm-hmm. look at the scriptures and read what it teaches us about what life in the new heavens and the new earth is going to be like, we see that, that the world of New Jerusalem is going to be a world of, of perfect beauty and of peace and of wholeness and of reconciliation. Uh, that it's going to be a world of joy and intimacy with God and, and perfect justice and, and security and safety. Uh, it's going to be a place of economic flourishing. And so all of those traits or characteristics I refer to as foretaste of the coming kingdom, and we work for those in our lives now. So when I think, for example, of the work of a friend of mine, Doug Wilson, he's an Indianapolis business person. I believe he's retired now, but For some years, he was a senior level executive for a company of a small manufacturing company, about a thousand employees in rural Indiana. And as as an HR executive in that company, he and some other folks in the company conducted uh, some research about their employees and without getting too much into the weeds, they discovered that they're healthy, that their employees were not as healthy as would be ideal. There were uh, quite a few sick days. There were a lot of workman's comp issues. There were, you know, some productivity issues. They found that people weren't necessarily going to the doctor when they were sick because, you know, we're working in a rural area and to take off of work and drive all the way to where the doctor was. Mm -hmm. Then you sit around and wait in the doctor's office forever and then you drive all the way back. Um, Takes so much time. The company offered a, a pretty good health plan as part of the benefits for the employees, um, but some of them still were not necessarily able to make some of the co-pays for their prescription medicines. So basically, the research that they had conducted indicated that their employees just weren't as healthy as, as would be ideal. And Doug and some others at the company spearheaded an initiative through which the end result was that they collaborated with a nonprofit organization whose mission it is to help for-profit companies 
establish um, on-site health and wellness centers at the uh, right on the campus of, of the factory or the manufacturing plant or you know whatever the business is. Mm-hmm. And so they went ahead and they established one of these 24/7, 365, you know, days a year clinics right there. People could go there. They can see a doctor. They can see a nurse practitioner. There's a pharmacy as part of that. There's a PT uh, as part of that. There's actually an X-ray machine there. Mm-hmm. And so they provided this benefit. You know, set up this, established this clinic right there on site. This was in addition to the regular health plan that that the employees had, and all of these services were available to them free of charge. And Doug, in Mm -hmm. making his presentation to the, you know, the higher-ups in the company and the owners and everyone, obviously he had to provide some financial analysis about uh, this was going to cost a certain amount of money for the company to establish this health and wellness center. And uh, the question was, you know, how long was it going to take before that investment could be recouped in, in terms of healthier workers and therefore lower insurance costs for the workers, mm-hmm. um, greater productivity, you know, fewer lost work days, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And in their financial projections, they said in their proposal that they believe that the investment uh, for this health and wellness center would basically kind of pay for itself after about three years. Uh, mm-hmm. And in fact, it paid for itself in the very first year. They came out over $300,000 ahead. And there were employees whose health uh, significantly improved. There were employees who were able to um, get things caught in a sort of early detection of some pretty serious illnesses that then people were able to get on top of right away. And in some cases, that it really was life-saving. Mm-hmm. And uh, beyond that, you know, just in general, the health of the employees really improved. So to me, that's a great example of a business person you know, working in a company, using his influence, using his smarts, you know, using creative thought to say, what, how can we think outside the box a little bit? You know, our company is a good company. We offer health insurance. That's a great thing. But how could we bring even more health to our people? Because health and wholeness are so very important. They're very important for the flourishing of the employees and their families. And, you know, they're important for our bottom line as a company. And so he was able to do that, and uh, to me, that's a great example of vocational stewardship. Wow, that's good. I, you know, I, it made me think of Arthur Guinness a little bit as you were telling this story of how he cared for all his workers way back, way back when. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. That's just amazing. I think of a lot of companies that do that uh, extraordinarily well, and it's a great testimony. And not only does it improve the lives of those who work with them, but it says a lot to the world. Let's uh, talk practically because one of the things uh, we want to do is to have some time for Q and I promise you we won't go beyond the top of the hour, but um, with some practical steps for marketplace professionals, people out in the working world, what steps can they take to uh, being able to better practice what we call uh, vocational stewardship? Well, I think one of the things is to kind of think about that, that laundry list that I mentioned of these fortes of the kingdom, whether it's justice or wholeness or, or beauty or et cetera, mm-hmm. uh, to, to think mm-hmm. about those things and then to consider, well, given what I'm doing, you know, as an educator or as an attorney or as an architect or as a financial planner or as a salesperson, given what I'm particularly doing, what are those kingdom fortes that I have real opportunity to advance? I think that's one of the steps, is to really think about the particularities of that. I think another very helpful thing is to ask uh, fundamental questions about the work, about the field of work that one is involved in. You know, again, whether it's medical care, or whether it's education, uh, whether it's the business community, to think about, you know, what, what were God's original creational designs for this field of work, you know, what is the way that things are supposed to, how are things supposed to be done uh, in, in this <laughs> right, field, right. Of, field of work? And then to ask a second question, which is, okay, well, that's sort of how things ought to be, but how are things now? You know, what are the types of particular corruptions that have come into this field of labor? What are the particular idolatries, for example, that mm. seem to mark this particular uh, sphere of work? 
and how can we name those and resist those things? And then to ask thirdly the question, well, you know, Jesus has come into the world and the kingdom is now as well as not yet, and that means mm-hmm. there's real possibility for creative changes, mm-hmm. um, reforms, ways of doing things that are kind of different than just doing things the way they've always been done. And so to ask questions about, you know, how can I, perhaps with others in my field or others in my workplace or others in my company, how can I participate in uh, the renewal that Christ is bringing about in this sphere of work? What kinds of values does this company follow? And how can I make suggestions about how our practices can be brought into ever-increasing alignment uh, Mm -hmm. with our uh, stated values? What are some different ways we could think about in the processes that we follow as a manufacturing company? Are we being as green-friendly, for example, as we can? What about how we treat our vendors, our suppliers, and where we get this stuff from? Um, Are there some creative ways that we could source what we get? in ways that would bring perhaps greater economic opportunity to certain kinds of firms, like minority-owned uh, firms, for example? Or, or what about how do we how do we treat our customers? And are there ways that we could improve our customer services in ways that make our services ever more transparent and ever more relevant and helpful to our people? Uh, so kind of just really trying to think creatively and even sort of outside the box about so how can we do the things we do in this field of work uh, better? And how can we do things differently? Uh, where do we need to sort of question um, uh, unquestioned assumptions? Maybe have prevailed for a long time, but, you know, maybe those things need to be, uh, you know, rattled a little bit and try to think of new ways to do things. Um, mm-hmm. So asking those sorts of kinds of questions that kind of relate to the biblical story of creation, fall, and, and redemption I think are wonderful things to do. I actually have a whole list of questions like that, Bill, um, that people can download from my website, uh, which is www.vocationalstewardship.org, vocationalstewardship.org. And and there's a resources section where people can download those questions. The last thing I'd say is I think that it's very useful when folks from the same uh, sort of sector get together. So for Christians that are involved in business or Christians that are involved in education or healthcare or in the arts or in journalism or in law to sit down together and talk with one another about those sorts of questions that I just was rattling off and talk a little bit about, you know, what are the unique challenges that Christians, for example, you know, working on Wall Street, you know, how, what what is it that they need to navigate? What is it that Christians working in the media kind of need to navigate? Um, what are the ways in which Christians working in the fashion industry can be a voice for good and a voice for the common good? Those sorts of things, I, I think when Christians from similar work sectors can come together, they can have very fruitful conversations about these sorts of things. That's awesome. I have actually downloaded those questions from the website because they are just really, really good. Brooke is going to Brooke is going to send you the link, by the way, to everybody so that you can see that and uh, be able to uh, get those questions and get all the other resources that are on that on that great website as well. You're talking to a lot of people, Amy, who have uh, dedicated uh, basically almost the last year of their life to this program, to reading books and attending webinars and residencies or affiliate groups and praying and uh, all kinds of things. Uh, developing their own mission statement and a vision statement and a three-year plan and uh, it's exciting and what you're really giving them I think is uh, as a pathway for people who are already working now instead of thinking well I've got to leave work and do something else maybe God has them there for a reason you know That's right. and uh, I was wondering if uh, to, to just before I start taking questions you know the pathways that you give in deploying your vocation power the four pathways can I get you just to say a comment or two about each one of those and then uh, Brooke will start taking some questions okay so the, the first sure. one is uh, bloom where you're planted yeah and that's I think the most important one and it basically is about asking just the sorts of questions I was running through so right now right where I'm at in the job I currently hold what are the fortes of the kingdom that I 
uh, can can advance. What are the ways in which I can use my influence, whether I have a lot of influence in the job that I hold now or whether I don't have very much influence? Uh, I certainly have some. I believe that everyone has some degree of vocational power, even those that are, quote, unquote, you know, lower down on the corporate ladder, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Everyone does have some degree of influence. So blooming where your planet is really looking for those opportunities and asking those sorts of questions. How can I make my workplace a more just, a more beautiful, a more hopeful, a more flourishing place? What can I do in terms of my own work to work with excellence and to see my work as worship? And how can I think Christianly and biblically about the sphere of work that I'm engaged in? And uh, how can I advance God's uh, purposes in this particular sphere of work while resisting uh, the corruptions that has entered into that field of work. Mm -hmm. uh, pathway two I call Donate Your Skills. And that's one that I've put in there largely for people who feel that their vocation and their occupation aren't really the same. So they might really be talented as a musician or an artist, and that's really their sense of their vocational call. But at the present moment, um, that is not what they're actually getting paid to do. So they may be an aspiring uh, musician or actress, but what they're actually doing is waiting tables at restaurants. They, I believe they need to be the best waitress as they possibly could be. But at the same time, they can also think about uh, using those skills as an actress or a musician outside of the regular 9-to-5 job and offer those skills to... Uh, agencies or to nonprofit groups or to churches and make a difference using those particular talents and skills that they've been given. You know, this is the graphic designer who still hasn't actually landed his job as a graphic designer and he's working as a barista at, uh, at Starbucks, but he could certainly, still, uh, you know, design a website for, uh, you know, a local, uh, you know, city rescue mission or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. um, pathway three is what I call launch a social enterprise, and that's where people think about, you know, I've been, I've acquired a certain amount of knowledge, skill, a network, assets, etc. in my sort of workaday profession, and now I think I could take all that I have acquired and I could actually start something new. I could start a new for-profit or not-for-profit uh, enterprise with this wealth of knowledge that I've developed or the networks and stuff that I've been privileged to acquire, and I could really advance kingdom fortes through some sort of uh, new initiative that I innovate. So if mm -hmm. pathway one kind of is an opportunity to uh, be what Keller calls an intrapreneur, so staying within your field, you know, as an attorney and working for the flourishing of that firm and of its clients, but also for the flourishing of the common good, staying within the firm, pathway three is about saying, oh, well, as a lawyer, what other things might I do outside the firm? Maybe I could start my own legal advocacy that is centered specifically around criminal justice reform or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then pathway four is a little bit tricky to uh, quickly articulate, but basically what it is, it's really more of a pathway that I encourage churches to think about where they have a vision for some sort of pretty major uh, long-term initiative, you know, to sort of say, we're going to partner with this particular neighborhood in our city for the next 30 years, or we're going to partner with this one particular organization like International Justice Mission, for example, or we're going to really take on this particular cause, like the cause of addressing uh, hunger in our community, or some sort of really multifaceted, very comprehensive, very ambitious, long-term initiative. And Pathway 4 is when individual marketplace Christians would see this targeted initiative that perhaps their church is engaged in or a group of churches that is engaged in, and they begin to ask themselves questions, okay, how as, a, as an architect or an artist or an accountant might I sort of join into that particular initiative in that community or on behalf of that cause? Um, where are the places where I could fit um, specifically using my vocational power, my vocational platform, mm -hmm. my vocational skills mm -hmm. within that initiative to make my contribution. And that's what I call Pathway mm -hmm. for uh, investing in a targeted initiative. Wow, that's great. And I think that the people listening to you tonight, uh, they are and have been mulling over that 
themselves. How can I transform to what I've been doing and how I've been doing it, which is in many ways just a very provincial way of serving Christ. You go to church, you do this, you give, and so on, to see my whole life, my whole 24-hour day being a gift back to the Lord for His goodness. Right. So. Thanks for listening to today's Breakpoint Podcast with Dr. Bill Brown and Dr. Amy Sherman. I do hope you will consider applying to the Colson Fellows program. Please come to colsonfellows.org for more information. And by the way, if you'd like a copy of Amy Sherman's excellent book, Kingdom Calling, Vocational Stewardship for the Common Good, we have it for you at our online bookstore at breakpoint.org. For the Colson Center, I'm Breakpoint producer Steve Ryder. Thanks for listening.